six men. This is the maddest, baddest, most miserable thing I've ever done. One tiny wooden boat. And the most dangerous feat of survival in the history of exploration. The waves are breaking all around us. Can these men repeat the extraordinary achievements of Sir Ernest Shackleton? You're walking in the boots of a legend, really. Sail 800 nautical miles of the roughest ocean on Earth. If you don't respect it, he'll kill you. With no engine. We're totally at the mercy of the wind. A hundred year old clothes. I can't feel of any of my fingers. No GPS. Crack the right. You just have to hope the boat's strong enough. And then climb a deadly mountain range. This is an extremely remote place. My daughter and my wife are worried that I'm not going to ever see them again. My God, it's hard work. Ah! Literally our last chance saloon. Five days since leaving land in the notorious Southern Ocean, the crew of the tiny Alexandra Shackleton lifeboat have survived their first storm. There's snow in the air, snow in the sails. This is magnificent, absolutely magnificent. But for the last 24 hours, they've been hammered by six meter waves and relentless 50 knot winds. In this tiny lifeboat, these men have taken on the most dangerous sea crossing imaginable. Completed only once before by Anglo-Irish polar explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton. A hundred years ago, Shackleton and 27 men were stranded in Antarctica after their ship was crushed and sunk by pack ice. The disaster was captured on film by expedition cameraman Frank Hurley. I cannot describe the impression of relentless destruction that was forced upon me. The flows with the force of millions of tons of ice behind them were simply annihilating the ship she went down, bows first. One quick dive, and the ice closed over her forever. It gave one a sickening sensation to see it. Facing starvation and a frozen hell, Shackleton chose five men and set out in a tiny lifeboat to try and reach help on what was to become the greatest rescue mission of all time. If he'd stayed put, he would have died through bold behavior and being a great leader, he succeeded, a wonderful achievement of survival. But from the moment Shackleton pushed off, the pictures stopped. A thousand miles from civilization in Antarctica, Shackleton left 22 men on Elephant Island and headed north into the vast Southern Ocean. Their only hope was to cross 800 nautical miles or 1,500 kilometers of the roughest seas on the planet and somehow reach a whaling station on a tiny speck of land called South Georgia. Now Tim Jarvis and his crew are five days into the same desperate journey. This boat is from waves that crashed in last night. Basically came straight through the, through the hatch here. If we don't pump the water out, the snow leaks that we've got become bigger leaks. It'll just keep rising and rising and rising and fill this compartment and to sink it. To find out how Shackleton and his men managed to survive against all the odds, this crew are sailing a replica boat with the same makeshift clothes and hundred-year-old equipment. What we're attempting to do in, in recreating this journey is really all about navigating the old way through this roughest of oceans to the smallest of islands. And the achievement of us reaching South Georgia would be 
one of the great modern feats of navigational skill and endurance. Now, a hundred miles out in this notorious ocean, the crew of the Alexandra Shackleton are in a race to find out where they are before the next storm hits. The Southern Ocean always has several storms tracking across it, um, but uh, without weather forecast, we have absolutely no idea which direction it's coming from uh, or how fast it's coming. Round the world yachtsman Paul Larson is responsible for navigation using the same 100-year-old technology as Shackleton. OK, Mark. You know, you're walking in, in the boots of a legend, really. And this is one of the greatest feats of small boat navigation ever that we're trying to replicate. The odds are sort of against us in doing that. And uh, a huge part of that responsibility is on my shoulders. Yeah, this is the, the first time we've taken a uh, proper site. Paul is using a device known as a sextant. If he can accurately measure the angle between the sun and the horizon and record the precise time of day, he can calculate their exact position on the planet. A fraction of a degree out, and they could miss their destination altogether. Can't get a good horizon. He can only get a reading while the sun and the horizon are clear. Hey, Mark. 3.24 and five seconds. OK, altitude. 51, 8.8. Sun's altitude at 24 minutes past three was 51 degrees and 08.8 minutes. Mark. 3.25 and 15 seconds. 51, 16.4. Shackleton's legendary skipper, Frank Worsley, was an expert with a sextant. But in the tiny lifeboat, even he struggled to take readings. North, 64 miles from Cape Wild, high swell and cross seas, I take observations of the sun for position. But the boat pitches, rolls and jerks so heavily that I can take them only with McCarthy and Vincent clinging to me on either side to prevent me pitching overboard. Worsley knew if they missed South Georgia, they would be blown out into 3,000 miles of open ocean and never see land again. It remains to this day one of the greatest feats of navigation in maritime history. This time, it's all down to Paul. Our estimated position was here, 6.52. I am now just going to run up northeast from our estimated position. 240, 60, 303 miles. 303 miles from Elephant Island. Pretty encouraging that we're doing the right maths and taking the sights, good accurate sights. You want to look at this totally objectively and you don't want to start talking yourselves into being somewhere you might not be. But right now, it, it, it is a good start. If their calculations are correct, it puts them an impressive 300 miles from Elephant Island and 180 miles ahead of Worsley and Shackleton's position after five days at sea. But the sailors' skills are about to be tested against a second southern ocean storm. Right now, I can see the wind and sea state is building. There's a, there's a high chance that in the next 24 hours, we're going to be seeing kind of winds up around 50 knots. We just have to hope the boat's strong enough. In these conditions, most of the team stay below deck. But expedition cameraman Ed Wardle is determined to keep the cameras rolling. Snowing in the Southern Ocean is virtually impossible. I'm holding on to the mast for my dear life. I can't feel my hands at all. Uh, this is definitely the hardest filming job I've ever taken on. Shackleton's cameraman, Frank Hurley, documented every detail of the expedition what was left behind on Elephant Island. There are no images of the boat journey until now. When they were on the little boat, nobody recorded that, and there were no photographs and no film. So if there's any reason to take part in this expedition, then it's to discover how they managed to survive this thing. What's the light, 
out of here, Sam. This is the maddest, baddest, craziest, most miserable thing I've ever done. To be so close to something so enraged makes you appreciate life a lot more. You know, if you don't respect it, it'll, it'll kill you. Climbing back into the boat, Ed narrowly misses being washed overboard. It's pretty dangerous because uh, if anybody falls in the water here, I think they're, they're a goner. It's tough out there, and uh, the last thing you want to be doing is uh, walking around on deck. I'm amazed that my cameras are all still working. Lots of breaking seas around us in the building. The boat's a bit of a handful to sail. We're just in survival mode, pretty much as uh, Shackleton and Worsley would have been. Storms like this plagued Shackleton and Worsley too. On day three of their journey, they were blown 100 miles off course, the most tempestuous storm-swept area of water in the world. The gales are almost unceasing. We fight the seas and the winds, and at the same time have a daily struggle to keep ourselves alive. At times, we are in dire peril. A century later, history is repeating itself. We're battling our way across these winds, basically pointing to the south of South Georgia. We're totally at the mercy of the wind. Three hundred nautical miles from land, the crew of the Alexandra Shackleton are battered by a second southern ocean storm. And it's blowing them off course. The southern Ocean's dealing all the cards now. For navigator Paul, it's the worst possible scenario. Our only option is to head east and try and somehow just angle the boat up a little bit to the north if we can. We're totally at the mercy of the wind. Just rolling with the punches. The notorious Southern Ocean packs a punch like no other. Powered by frequent hurricane force winds, waves regularly reach 10 meters and have been recorded over 30 meters high. Circling the planet between Antarctica and 55 degrees south, the Southern Ocean flows like a giant river from west to east. Shackleton knew to have any hope of reaching South Georgia, they must sail north as the prevailing wind and currents would push them east. But the Alexandra Shackleton is being blown too far east, too soon. Navigator Paul must try and work out if they're far enough north to make it to South Georgia. 641, plus 10 degrees. East northeast for 10 miles, east plus 10 degrees for 47 miles, and east for 21 nautical miles. And this is where we think we are now, and we've come from over here. So the joke's over now. We've seen that we're going to have put in 78, 90 miles easting virtually no northing. Losing 90 miles to the east and still heading in the wrong direction, Tim Jarvis's expedition could soon be over. We don't want another day like today, tomorrow. If we get the same kind of wind as we've had, then we just keep going further east, but we don't get far north enough to make the island. With every mile now critical, Paul takes the helm to try and steer north. What we really need to do is make one more big dig to the north. The trouble is, if I point the boat too much into the north, these sails flap and the boat stops going forward and we just sit here going sideways doing nothing. Now we just sort of settle into this groundhog day of routine and watches and boat life, I suppose. Suffering in freezing wind and waves, all he can do is hope and wait for a change in the weather. While the rest of the crew endures cramped conditions below decks. There'd be some form of living hell for some people to be below decks on this boat. We'd be stuck down below with six smelly guys in itchy traditional woolen sort of undergarments. Anyone else's jumper stunt feel really heavy? Oh, yeah. 
Lights. And then there's the nausea and lethargy. Then there's the uncertainty and the, you know, the fear. Bit of a cocktail shaker of emotion down there. When you get to the stage that you really are physically suffering, a weak voice comes into your head telling you you want to stop. And you need to know that that weakness is going to come so that you have the mental other side to fight it to keep going. It's dark and wet, just one and a half meters by two meters and under a meter high. They can't sit up straight or stretch out. This is the ceiling. I'm sleeping in a, in a kind of coffin-shaped space. Cramped in our narrow quarters and continually wet by the spray, we suffer severely from cold. The perpetual motion of the boat makes repose impossible. We are cold, sore, and anxious. The one place you would not want to wake up is on Shackleton's boat journey. <laughs> do most of the, the helming now because the courses that we're, we're steering and are really important and we can't afford to uh, too far off the off course. Yeah, there is a lot riding on us getting this right. The long cold hours at the helm and tortuous conditions below are beginning to test the team. Tim, you're going to have to screw that course coming in. I can be any near the decking of the boat if I try. Well, what are you suggesting? You have to tuck your knees up. Which way do you want to go, Paul? Where do you want to go, mate? You decide, I'll do the you, rest. You tell me, when someone comes down from a watch, this is the place they sit. So you've got to get this top trailer. Let's get no, some more. Just, 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 just calm down a bit. It's so annoying. Let's see, that's all I need. Feed back over. Dawn, day nine, brings the wind change Paul's been praying for. Finally, we've got into a good, strong band of these westerlies, and uh, they are beautiful. They are blowing us straight at the mark. Five days since Paul's last sunset, and blown 100 miles off their planned route, the Alexandra Shackleton sails northeast at last. But they still don't know if they're far enough north to reach South Georgia. Every break in the clouds is a chance for Paul to try and work out where they are. OK, are you guys ready on the, uh, on the clock? Ready on the clock. I'm going to try and get when those swells aren't riding on the horizon. It's very difficult, this. Got to pick swells. Mark. 11, 11 and 10 seconds. 29 degrees. 29 degrees. 33 minutes even. They all seem pretty consistent with a, uh, with a rising sun. This sun sight should tell them if they have any chance of reaching South Georgia. 54 degrees and 17 minutes south is exactly what we want to hear. It's bloody exciting. 54, 17 is here. Look at that. That's our cross. That's our cross. This is a sacrilege. I'm using a pen on a chart, but I'm so excited, I'm just going to do it. This is our new estimated position. Their new estimate puts them just 44 nautical miles from South Georgia. In just 10 hours, they could be on solid ground. 44 miles to go. We're not lost now. No. I'm going to give him breeze out a great sigh of relief. We're not no, we were lost. never lost. We were never lost, yeah. If we were American, we would definitely be high five. Come on, give us a little high five. There's not room for a high five in this boat. Oh, never, ever give you a high five. <laughs> never, that's where I draw the line. This expedition has only been given permission to go ahead, accompanied by an observer ship. But the skipper, Ben Wallace, has spotted an error in their navigation that puts them in serious danger. They're actually much closer to the land than they, they think they've got that much to go to the land, whereas they've only really got that much. The, the closest point of land is 15 miles. 
if I continue on this course and this speed, that would be on the rocks by about one o'clock in the morning. After 10 days in open ocean, the crew of the Alexandra Shackleton is heading for disaster. If I continue on this course and this speed, they hit the rocks. Nearing the treacherous coastline of South Georgia in thick fog, they're 11 miles further north than they think, and they're on a collision course. What's going through my mind is what to tell them and how to tell them and what the weather is going to do between now and daylight. The crew of the Alexandra Shackleton have instructed Ben not to contact them, unless he believes their lives are in danger. So this is us now about here, and the wind's coming in from this direction. Then by midnight, it swings quite quickly to the southwest. We're going to meet in the wrong place at night with fog. The Alexandra Shackleton plans to sail through the night and land in the morning. We should see land fairly soon, I hope. It's all hidden away behind all that clag behind me. This is awesome. This is awesome. Can't wait to see it. Can't wait to, can't wait to see it. I can't wait to get ashore. <laughs> but at midnight, in thick fog, and with the wind blowing them onto the rocks, they will have no chance of escape. Is tell them to hold the course, which is exactly, exactly what I've been trying not to do. Alexandra Shackleton, Australis. Ever since the beginning, we knew that this point may come, and unfortunately, it has. Yeah, ben, it's next weekend, over. Just wanted to contact you and let you know that, uh, given your current estimated position. We strongly recommend that you hold your position until daylight tomorrow morning. OK, uh, message received and uh, understood. OK, thanks, Nick. Standing by. Hold our position here. Yeah. The only reason he's got in touch with us is based on the safety protocol of us being maybe closer in than we thought. So the annoying thing about this is that uh, we're pretty sure we know exactly where we are now. South Georgia is just, just somewhere right there in that murk and we just can't see it. Um, we're pretty much going to have to park ourselves tonight and wait until the visibility improves. This is all part of the 100 year old experience I suppose. Similar conditions also forced Shackleton and Worsley to wait offshore. Strong nor-nor-west breeze, misty and foggy, sighted land nine miles ahead. It would be madness to land in the dark, and with a heavy sea on a beach we have never seen and which has never been properly charted. But that night, Shackleton was hit by a storm that lasted two days and almost killed them. You know, skipper of this boat, I'm sort of responsible for the safety of everyone on it. You know, I might be taking these guys in with a huge storm forecast, um, and that would obviously be really dangerous. Uh, and there's a part of me that says, at, at what point do I say, OK, I need to know where I am, what the weather forecast is now, this is getting a bit too scary. Drifting through the night, the crew take turns to keep watch. After 11 days at sea, and now within 10 miles of the treacherous coastline of South Georgia, engineer Seb Coulthard finally spots land. I can see two small islands with quite a long stretch of headland, and right in the distance, in the fog bank, there's, uh, there's quite a large island, I'm not entirely sure where it is. To have any chance of making it in safely, they have to figure out which bit of land they're about to hit. We are facing pretty much that direction. This headland here, yeah. you can see much more clearly 
just to the right. See what I mean? There's two on Which there. definitely fits with that. Okay. See what I mean? We're somewhere up and around here. King Harkin Sound is down over here. I don't think it can hurt us to head in that direction. A hundred years before them, Shackleton and Worsley finally escaped the open ocean into a 10 mile long inlet called King Harkin Sound. This crew want to take the same route and land on the same beach. We're just making our approach here on the northern side of King Harkin Bay. The wind has just gone from the sort of northwest round to the west. And we're only just going to make it round the corner here. We're battling hard here to keep clear enough of the headland to actually round, make the final corner into King Harkin Bay. Nick wants to steer as far away as possible from the rocky headland, but the wind is forcing the replica lifeboat dangerously close. Probably the most dangerous bit of this whole trip was arriving at South Georgia, and here we are. With no ability to sail against the wind, they are forced into shallow water between the headland and outlying rocks. There's a wave breaking on it. Stay up there. Shackleton, too, faced disaster within a stone's throw of land. Our position has become desperate. The wind and set of the sea is driving us ashore, but we can do nothing. The chances of surviving seem small. I think most of us feel the end is very near. Uh, I'll just be light jackets on, because the wind is blowing us onshore, and we have to go in between some rocks where boats don't normally go. Astralis, Astralis, oh, yes, copy. Yeah, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, Ben, just letting you know, from what I can see up ahead, there might be a few rocks awash on our course. Risking these shallow and uncharted waters, the larger ship Astralis cannot stay with them. Yeah, there's a rock up ahead to break the water on well, if you hit a rock with sufficient speed, you'd probably punch planks in underneath the boat, and the boat would start to flood. You have to stay on board the boat for as long as you can, especially when the water is at two degrees centigrade and you're only wearing woolen clothing. Two months earlier in training back in the UK, Seb showed signs of hypothermia after just 22 minutes in 15 degree water. In Antarctica, in water barely above freezing, the initial cold shock would be enough to produce a heart attack. This was not a problem a couple of hours ago, but that wind has swung. We see a whole load of rocky outcrops. So see the bay opening up. Just five miles to go, but one touch on a rock and the wooden lifeboat would be destroyed. It's making what should be quite a relaxed sail extremely tense. Finally clear of the rocks, Nick gets his first glimpse of a place to land. I think I can see the bay opening up. After 11 days in open ocean for 800 miles, enduring sub-zero temperatures, sleep deprivation and appalling conditions, slowly it becomes clear the crew of the Alexandra Shackleton has made it. Sailing in, I'm very happy to say, King Harkin Bay. We just made it around that headland by the skin of our teeth. It's great. This is one of the best moments of my life. It's an unbelievably exciting moment. Everything is worthwhile now. Everyone will remember this success. It's the first time anyone has successfully recreated this epic crossing and landed on the same beach as Shackleton. This is four years of kind of pain and ambition and aspiration, you know. And here we are, we just nailed it.
I'm really glad to get off the boat. <laughs> I can barely stand up straight, but I'm really glad to get off the boat. I sprang ashore and held on when the boat went out with the backward surge. In a few minutes, we were all safe on the beach with the boat floating in the surging water. It was a splendid moment. Personally, I feel it's the, it's the closest I've ever been to, be, to being immersed in history, where you've taken something that's written word and photographs and, you, and you've turned it into reality. And, um, and you couldn't pick a greater journey than, than this. You can imagine what it felt like for those guys to get here and I, you can see why they wanted to set off because they'd come this far, they'd done so much and just over that hill was civilization again and uh, God, the, the draw of that must have been overwhelming. After two years lost in Antarctica and despite surviving an impossible sea crossing, Shackleton's torment was far from over. Standing in the way of salvation for himself and the 22 men he left behind was an uncharted and unclimbed mountain range. But he had no climbing equipment. Once again, Shackleton had no choice but to attempt the impossible. On Elephant Island, 22 men are waiting for the relief that we alone can secure for them. Their plight is worse than ours. We must push on somehow. Now the crew of the Alexandra Shackleton must take on the same deadly mountain traverse. Now there's a lot of things can, can still go wrong. We've got to really be careful and not get too excited about the fact that we're there because there's a massive hurdle still to cross. Tim Jarvis and his crew have survived 11 days at sea and made it to South Georgia the halfway point of their expedition. We basically got to go straight up that snow slope there, the Shackleton Gap, and then all the way along the spine of South Georgia, crossing several glaciers and one mountain range. With 28 men's lives at stake, Shackleton had to try and reach civilization on the other side of the island. Forced to leave three injured men on the beach under their upturned boat, just three of them set out to scale the uncharted and unclimbed mountain range to try and reach help. Myself, Tim and Ed in this authentic gear, we're going to follow in his footsteps. We're going to use the same route, crossing the same glaciers uh, with the same kit and equipment. Royal Marine Mountain leader Barry Gray and extreme filmmaker and two times Everest summiteer Ed Wardle will accompany Tim on the traverse. This isn't an easy climb. We're all exhausted after the boat crossing, so nobody's in their, you know, 100% fitness state. We're wearing these, you know, cotton pajamas pretty much now. These are worn down so much, they're not waterproof at all. You know, we'll be freezing. To cross the mountains like Shackleton with no climbing equipment has never been attempted before. Nick Bubb, Seb Coulthard, and Paul Larson will cross the island as a backup team carrying emergency supplies. Our three guys will wear modern clothing, and in the event that we fall into a crevasse and need some sort of backup, uh, they will be our backup. But on board the Astralis, Nick discovers all is not well. Alex, my feet <laughs> killing. Expedition doctor Alex Kumar is an expert in cold weather injuries. It's sort of a throbbing pain. Um, kind of makes me wince every now and again. Uh, they're red and swollen. Characteristic of trench foot. When your feet are cold for long periods, you get a strangling process of the nerves that run inside. The risk is, by going up and over, you could do irreversible permanent damage. Trench foot kills the nerves and flesh of the feet. Untreated, it usually results in gangrene and the need for amputation. Three of Shackleton's men were unfit to make the crossing. Releasing feet like that, I'd have to intervene and say you can't go. Unable to walk without pain, Nick Bubb is off the backup team. On the Alexandra Shackleton, Dr. Kumar checks the others for any sign of trench foot. Take them off, yeah. Can you feel me touching your feet? No. Here? No. What about here? No. Your nerves have been damaged. 
and my advice to you is they say you, you know you shouldn't do it there's no way to know what damage you've done on the inside and more so if that's irreversible well i think that's in other circumstances i wouldn't take the risk but um, yeah, you, you know would, we're, yeah. we're in the middle of something big here and, and yeah. i reckon if i've got dry socks and dry boots to start then um it should be all right 24 hours okay it's your decision i can only tell you what i know which is well, there's no real reason why i wouldn't be able to walk uh no can you please put the camera off Quite frankly, Alex, I find this irresponsible of you to be coming on here and, and scaremongering like this. I've talked to you, you know, you've asked me what I think. This is a diagnosis. I'm, I'm frankly almost too incensed to, to speak. I'm, I'm missing something. I need here, you too. to get off this boat now because we need to keep a focus on trying to do this expedition. Okay. All right, I'm going. <clears throat> this has to be your decision, Ed. It's, it's, it's up to you what you do. Well, no, I think they're, they're going to be okay. It's a bit frustrating being an expedition doctor. I'm not wanting to scaremonger. I'm just wanting to present the facts and let people make the decisions. It's just not ethical to say that someone's fit to go when they're clearly not. On board the Astralis, Skipper Ben Wallace and Nick Bubb check the weather for the mountain crossing. If we go to Friday in rain, point three. That's the heaviest we've seen so okay. far. Let's now switch this to snow. So you can see wow. the snowfall, 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 snowfall. The wind speeds, 25 knots. We know that could be 40, 50 knots in the mountains, which is, is a lot. And the 75% cloud cover. I mean, that's just terrible weather. Uh, Tim's not going to like this. With the pathetic clothes and equipment they had left, Shackleton waited 10 days for the perfect weather. His skipper, Worsley, knew a storm in the mountains would likely kill them. Terrific gales scourge the coast, and on the uplands, the storm demons work their will and wreak their fury. The hell that reigns up there can blind a man and take away his senses. We must go warily to pick a day of finest, fairest weather and a full moon to guide our steps by night. Like Shackleton, Tim, Ed, and Baz plan to do the crossing without modern weather forecasts. But Nick Bubb and mountaineering cameraman Joe French think that they may be walking into a life-threatening situation. Do you want to know the weather forecast this week? Not, not really. The forecast conditions do cause significant concern. This is this is South Georgia. It's not in Brighton. You know, I mean, it, it is what it is. Back home in Scotland, cameraman Joe French is a climber for one of the busiest mountain rescue teams in the UK. Conditions as they are, we shouldn't be setting foot on the mountain. It's a gusty, windy day. So we do need a clear chain of command here. It's not going to be a vote. Effectively, us wearing this crappy old gear, we're going to be the first ones to go, quite frankly. Not you know, necessarily. So, so, is it, not is necessarily. So, oh, but, but, people with no experience at all you're about but, to take but, up there. But, 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 but Joe, don't. Please, just, just don't talk across me. Just, just listen to what I'm saying. We're talking about the wind and the wet. These things leave like a sieve. Do you want to put one on? You're sitting in your, your full-piece dry suit. These things really are like tea bags. So please don't question that. I really My mean it, okay? My question wasn't there. Well, My it seemed to be. was about but just being up there in a group in these kind of conditions. We've not come to recreate Shackleton's journey to just you know, look at the satellite images and wait for a day where the sun's shining, we just trip across there in sunny weather. I mean, it, there has to be a certain level of adversity. So you, you can't be in, in the mountains in these conditions. That's, uh, for me, that's the bottom yeah. line. Major point, completely understand. I'm not going to walk anyone into a completely ridiculous situation. I'm just not going to rule it out and just say, we're going to wait till Saturday either. We have made the most difficult survival journey in the world thus far seem manageable. And we've done it without crying, falling out, anyone dying, anyone being seriously injured. I'm just a little bit riled by the fact that now we have a little bit of wet weather and 20 knots of wind coming in, we're all acting like children. With support climber Nick Bubb too injured to walk, Time running out and no let up in the weather, Tim has to come to a decision. Hands have decided uh, for the departure up Shackleton Gap across the island, leaving at midnight tonight. 
the weather is not going to be great, but it's not bad enough for us to not go. And I think the key thing now is uh, getting moving uh, because morale is starting to be uh, eaten into a little bit sitting around here. I've spent a lifetime in the mountains and I know how quickly things can go wrong and especially when you're looking at conditions like this, it's blowing 25 knots outside at sea level which is probably 40 or 50 miles an hour up in the mountains where under normal circumstances I wouldn't be going out into the mountains. No way. It's all down to us now. Uh, we can uh, really achieve this incredible feat if we just keep our focus for another 24 to 48 hours. We shouldn't be going. No, of course we shouldn't. We should be waiting for a weather window like Shackleton did. With no way to turn back once they've left and no hope of rescue, Dr. Kumar calls Ed to the Australis for one final check. So how are your feet today? A lot of pain last night. It just kept me awake. Look a bit red. Yeah, I mean, you can feel that warmer. I'm afraid to say I'd advise you do not go up that mountain. I'm really sorry, mate. You know, I, I don't want you to come to harm, Ed. I really don't. They, you, you should not go up that mountain, OK? okay. It's really not worth it. To try to convince Ed not to go, Alex has written out advice from cold injury experts back in the UK. <sighs> the feet are now very prone to frostbite. Strong possibility if he's crossing a high glacier and inadequate boots. <clears throat> if he gets frostbite on top of his current injury, he may lose all or part of his feet. <clears throat> it's such a hard thing at the moment. You know, we've been sitting around for a while. I'm pretty exhausted, um, and it you know you need a lot of positive energy and confidence to get you through these things. Um, so, to add somebody like a doctor saying you definitely shouldn't do this. Um, that's a, a big knock. After crossing the Southern Ocean, to hand over the camera for the final mountaineering leg of the expedition is a tough decision. We've gone through a lot together. It'd be great to have you there, but if it's, uh, if it's down to something like that, you can't risk it. I can't you can't risk it. it. You know, if I stopped your expedition up there, because some of my feet were make me unable yeah. to walk, then yeah. that's no good, is it? It's always been a team thing, and I mean, our success will be everybody's success. Good luck. Thanks for everything. Yeah. See you on the other side. Yeah. It's a, it's a real blow. It's a blow for him personally, it's a blow for us, because we're such a close-knit team. With the loss of expedition cameraman Ed Wardle, the success or failure of the Shackleton expedition is now down to Tim Jarvis, and mountain leader, Barry Gray. Now or never, let's make it now. With bad weather closing in. It's absolutely horrendous up here. Tim and Baz are determined to complete the final treacherous leg of their journey. It literally is one step at a time. The crossing of South Georgia. Ah!